You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. So what did it mean for an English settler in this relatively small town of Boston? Because this is before Boston really boomed as a trade port. Boston was just a small little corner, a kind of island in a Spanish sea. And this is the first instance that we know of, of any kind of literary or textual effort to make contact. Hello, and welcome to episode 376 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Catholics and Protestants haven't always gotten along with each other. In fact, we know that during the 16th through 18th centuries, England, Germany, and the Netherlands formed Protestant alliances to help them counteract the Catholic alliances of Spain, France, and the Holy Roman Empire. And this world of religious alliances and rivalries is the world that gave birth to colonial America. Now, one way we can see these alliances and rivalries playing out is in the missionary efforts to the Americas. As we know, Spain and later France sent Catholic priests and friars to North and South America and the Caribbean, purportedly to save the souls of indigenous Americans by converting them to Catholicism. We also know that Protestants did similar work to help counteract Catholic work in the Americas. Now, one Protestant who sought to counteract the work of Catholic conversion was Cotton Mather, a Puritan minister from colonial Boston. Kirsten Silva Gruz, a professor of literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the author of Cotton Mather's Spanish Lessons, a story of language, race, and belonging in the early Americas, joins us to investigate Cotton Mather's work to write a Spanish language tract about the benefits of Protestantism for, quote, Spanish speaking Indians. Now, during our investigation, Kirsten reveals Cotton Mather's background and interest in Spanish activities across the Americas. How Mather, an English minister in colonial Boston, learned the Spanish language, and details about Mather's religious tract, La Fe del Cristiano, and how Mather used language as a tool of empire. But first, it's survey time. Ben Franklin's World is now in its 10th year of production, and it's been about six years since we last conducted a listener survey. The Innovation Studios team and I would love to know more about you and what you think about the show. So if you love this podcast, tell us. If you think the Time Warp section or some of the other show elements need updating, tell us. And if you think we should be adding a true video component on YouTube, tell us that too. The Ben Franklin's World Listener Survey is a place where you can tell us what you think about the show, me as a host, and where you'd like to see us take this podcast in the next 10 years. The survey is also a place where the team and I get to learn more about you. We create this podcast for you, and we want to serve you as best we can. So please help us out by taking our listener survey, benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. All right, are you ready to learn more about Cotton Mather and why he learned Spanish? Allow me to introduce you to our expert guide. Joining us is a professor of literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research specialty is in the comparative studies of the Americas, Chicano and Latino literary cultures, and literature in the 19th century United States. She's the author of numerous articles and two books, including Cotton Mather's Spanish Lessons, a story of language, race, and belonging in the early Americas. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kirsten Silva Gruz. Thank you, Liz. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm thrilled to be here. Kirsten, your book, Cotton Mather's Spanish Lessons, centers on a pretty unique text. It's a rare text called La Fide Cristiano, and it was published in 1699, and it's known to be the first Spanish language text printed in what is now the United States. In fact, it's so rare that only three copies of this publication still exist today. So I wonder if we could start with having you tell us about La Fide Cristiano and why this is such an important text. Sure. So La Fide Cristiano which translates as the faith of the Christian, presumably man, the Christian man, the Christian person, 
is a 16-page discussion of the principles of Protestantism, intermingling bits and pieces of Bible verses with the author's own words. And the content of La Fe del Cristiano is not really what's interesting about it. What's interesting about it is the fact that it exists at all and that it addresses and imagined audiences of non-English speaking people. So the full title of it is The Faith of the Christian in 24 Articles of Christ's Invention Sent Out to the Spanish, a los españoles, so they might open their eyes and turn from darkness to light and from Satan's power to God's, so they might receive through the faith that is in Jesus Christ remission of sins and be sorted among the elect. So my question was, what did Mather mean by los españoles? Was he thinking of people in Spain? Was he thinking of Spanish speakers? Was he thinking of Spanish descendants? It's also just really curious to think about Cotton Mather, this famed Boston Puritan minister, thinking about Spanish people at all. I mean, colonial New England was far removed geographically from the Spanish Atlantic Empire. And until the modern day, Boston and New England were not known or even thought about as places where Spanish-speaking people live. So I guess we should talk a little bit more about Mather and his concern for los españoles, the Spanish-speaking people. So Cotton Mather was born in 1663 to one of the most powerful families in New England. He was the grandson of two of the minister elites who had been part of the first generation of Boston settlers, John Cotton and Richard Mather. And he was a very influential minister. He took over his father, Increase Mather's second church in Boston. But most importantly, he was by far the most prolific writer in the colonial Americas. There is three volumes of a bibliography of his works. There are over 400 imprints that bear his name. Some of these are fairly small, they're broadsides. Some are about the size of the 16 page tract, A Fe del Cristiano. They're comparable tracts. Some are sermons, but he also wrote the first and very famous history of the English colonies, Magnalia Christi Americana. And he wrote a 10 volume Bible commentary, the Biblia Americana, that is over 1 million words long and is only now being published. He was a polymath. Cotton Mather was interested in science and medicine. He's known for his involvement in the first inoculation campaign in Boston in 1721. And he was just interested in everything. So what did it mean for an English settler in this relatively small town of Boston? Because this is before Boston really boomed as a trade port. Boston was just a small little corner a kind of island in a Spanish sea. And this is the first instance that we know of, of any kind of literary or textual effort to make contact. But it turns out that Cotton Mather was keeping track of what the Spanish were doing in the New World. And he was really immersed from childhood in the idea that it was England's destiny to try to redo the things that, in their view, the Spanish Catholics had done wrong in their colonization and evangelization of the Americas. It's really true. Before the Kennedys, the Mathers were pretty much New England's royalty back in the 17th century. Now, most of the titles you mentioned, Kirsten, Mather published in English. So what was the allure for Mather of trying to write this one track, La Fe de Cristiano, in Spanish? So there was a moment in the late 17th century, when Mather wrote that the ways to our communication with the Spanish Indies are opening. And it's true that Spain, which had kept a kind of jealous guard over trade to its colonies in the New World, briefly let that guard down. And so he and his confederate, his former tutor at Harvard, Samuel Sewell, they became very interested in gathering news from what today is called Mexico, but then was regarded as New Spain. So New Spain comprised most of the North American continent. These English settlements were just sort of small islands in the midst of it. And 
he was especially interested in what was going on in the Carolinas, which was a border zone between the little English settlements, which were disconnected in terms of being able to communicate or contact with each other, and Spanish Florida. One of the interesting things that Kirsten does with her book, Cotton Mather Spanish Lessons, is that she uses Mather's text as a way to explore language and its use in the early Americas. Now, Kirsten, as you pointed out, with indigenous communities, New Spain, New France, legacy of New Netherland, the English settlements, and the linguistic diversity arriving in North America with enslaved Africans, we're talking about a North American continent that has a vast diversity of different languages being used and spoken. Would you tell us more about language and its use in the early modern world and specifically in English North America? Yes. So when Mather directs La Fe del Cristiano a los Españoles to Spanish people, I argue that he also had in mind Spanish speakers. And in particular, he referred to three different people who passed through his household as servants as Spanish Indians. So this was puzzling to me. What is a Spanish Indian? Is it someone from the Spanish Indies? Is it someone who could be what we would call now mestizo, mulatto, someone of mixed race, someone who's a product of this already existing mingling, this ethnogenesis of new peoples in the Spanish Americas? The English were latecomers to colonization and missionization. And so they stepped into this world that was, as you said, full of indigenous languages from all over, but it was also full of what we call contact languages. So some of those Spanish Indians, if they were Spanish speaking Indians, could have inhabited or did inhabit the regions that bordered English settlements to the south in the Carolinas with Spanish Florida. And in fact, for a century prior to Mather, Spanish missionaries had been interacting with and building a kind of coexistence with a number of indigenous groups in Florida. And the English were then at war with the Spanish and their allies to the south. There really is a great diversity in early North America, because even if we're just looking at European peoples, there's three different European peoples, four if you count the short-lived Dutch colony, or five if you count the short-lived Swedish colony, interacting with each other and with indigenous peoples and trying to establish trade networks and colonies throughout North America and the Caribbean. So it seems like you would have to be multilingual in early North America just to get around and to function as a person living in this colonial environment. So Kirsten, how did people like Cotton Mather, who was trying to learn Spanish, how did early colonial Americans, especially English Americans like Mather, try to become fluent in indigenous and European languages? So it's often said about Mather that he was proficient in seven languages which is a bit of an exaggeration. He studied at Harvard, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Syriac, Aramaic, the biblical languages. And he had an extremely advanced proficiency in Latin, which was a spoken language for him. And like many missionaries who went before him, he used that kind of classificatory analytical power to try to impose some of those Latin grammatical categories onto the languages that he heard. Now, Mather did publish a couple of tracts in indigenous North American languages, in Algonquian and in an Iroquoian dialect. His name appears on them, but they were actually translated by other people. So he didn't know indigenous languages. But he did come up in a context where he was very aware of the prior work of John Eliot, the missionary to the Wampanoag, who had assembled this team of native converts, intellectuals who helped print what's known as the Indian Library. And Lisa Brooks has done amazing work on showing how those indigenous printers and translators were actually the forces behind that so-called Indian Library. But Cotton Mather was of a later generation. 
And even though he wrote about and respected John Eliot's work, he came of age after King Philip's War. And so for him, the prospect of becoming a missionary to Indigenous people himself was just not an appealing prospect. It seemed to him that that age was over. And in fact, as a commissioner of the New England Company in later life, he actually pulled the plug on the reprinting of that Wampanoag Bible. So he's kind of a latecomer to this project of missionizing in the Americas, but he sees Spanish as a way to triangulate a means of communication to those people that he describes as Spanish Indians. In other words, the Spanish speakers of the hemisphere comprised more than just European ethnic Spaniards. They comprised this world of mixed race people who spoke Spanish because it was a lingua franca of the region in Florida. It was a lingua franca in Mexico City, where a lot of assimilated indigenous and mixed race castas people were living. That's fascinating that Mather had missionary ambitions because missionary work was big in the 17th century. And even in the 18th century, when we learn about the history of early America, we learn about the French Jesuit priests, the Spanish Franciscans, other missionaries from other Catholic orders who are going out everywhere in North America and looking to convert indigenous peoples to Catholicism. And we know from speaking with other scholars like Brandon Bain that there were even schools established to teach Jesuits and other missionaries how to missionize. And part of that training was language. A Catholic missionary had to learn all sorts of indigenous languages if they were going to be successful with their job. And of course, like the English, the missionaries also tried to teach indigenous people Spanish or French because they really saw language as an important part of getting the word out about Catholicism among indigenous peoples. And this isn't really a story we hear about Protestants in English and later British America. The English had Protestant missionaries, but few seem to have really studied indigenous languages to convert indigenous peoples to Protestantism. Instead, they seem to have worked to teach indigenous peoples English so that they could communicate with them and teach them about Anglicanism and other Protestant faiths. So, Kirsten, would you talk more about the differing views of missionization and the use of language? during this period, the late 17th and early 18th centuries, to accomplish religious work? Exactly. So Mather left a clue on the Verso page of the title page. There are two epigraphs. One is to the Bible, and the other is to the 16th century Jesuit, José de Acosta, who wrote a tract that was not particularly well-known or well-circulated in the English-speaking world, about the best ways to proselytize to Native people. And so Mather really uses this tract as a kind of talk back to those earlier Spanish Jesuit priests. And you're right that we hear a lot about the pressures of the French Jesuits on the northern border of New England, but we don't think very much about the southern border because it's the Carolinas. But he's really interested in what's happening there. He responds with horror to some scenes of violence between the Westo and the English settlers in Carolinas. He responds with horror to hearing about what's happening on plantations in Barbados. So through his reading, he connects with Acosta. He refers to Acosta a lot. And Acosta had this theory that to missionize effectively, You had to meet people where they were. You had to really immerse yourself in their languages, in their worldviews. And after Acosta did this in Peru and wrote this influential tract, and of course, the Jesuits are well known for their intellectual capacities and their practice of spreading across the globe to learn those languages and kind of embed themselves in the cultures that they hope to convert. A Franciscan priest, Francisco de Pareja, went to Florida in the later 16th century and established missions there among the Tumuqua. So there were some 30 Florida mission towns. And 
instruction was given in the Timucua language, sometimes in the Spanish language, and to a few converts in Latin as well. So there's an image on the cover of my book that comes from a visitor to one of these mission schools who observed Pareja sitting in the middle of this room and all of the scribes sitting around writing. So as with Lisa Brooks's work, we hear about how the Wampanoag people were involved in the production of those Algonquian language texts in the Elliott Library, but we don't hear about Pareja and his workshop, or taller, which also leaned on indigenous converts who were themselves bilingual or trilingual. So we have this whole contact zone of people working in and with languages. And I'm sure if we could hear the sounds of the way they were speaking to each other, they were using sort of pigeons and combinations of speech like we hear in any immigrant community in the U.S. today. Yeah, pidgin languages are pretty unique because they're really just a smattering of words informed by multiple languages that people use and need to use to conduct trade and communicate with each other. So they're not really one language or another. They're a combination of languages. Yes, exactly. You mentioned Dutch, those early kind of Dutch manuals that we have recorded different indigenous words and terms and tried to force them into a grammar in which they didn't really fit. So Cotton Mather was a Protestant. And as you mentioned, Kirsten, he's really trained in a lot of classical and biblical languages. And we can say the same is true for Spanish and French missionaries who are mostly Catholic, but they're going to have a very similar linguistic training to Mather because they're all men of the cloth. So I wondered, Did Mather ever try to correspond with Catholic priests, if not in the French and Spanish languages, perhaps in Latin or one of the other biblical languages? Mather did correspond with German Protestants about questions of evangelization. And he wrote some French tracts after he wrote the Spanish tract. And in the French tract, which was meant for use on the northern border, and I believe that It was aimed not just at ethnic French speakers, but at that population of indigenous people who also spoke French, again, as a lingua franca, as a kind of third language of their own, because it meant something to indigenous people to be able to communicate with Europeans. And this includes the many, many sovereign nations that still controlled their own territory and their own destinies and had alliances with the Spanish or the French or the English. So Mather was always optimistic about converting Catholics. And although La Fe del Cristiano kind of distills the Protestant faith into its essentials, and it could have been used as a tract for anyone who had not been exposed to Christianity, there are some articles in it that specifically address what he saw as the mistaken beliefs of Catholics. So he said optimistically after he wrote the French tract that he was going to send it to some French Jesuits and hope that just this little 16-page tract was going to help them see the error of their Catholic ways. So it sounds like Protestant religious men are communicating with each other, but they're not necessarily communicating with Catholic religious men or vice versa. But it does sound like they're all writing these tracts about Protestantism or Catholicism And they're all hoping that people on the other side of the linguistic barrier there or the religious barrier there are going to read them and possibly even be converted by them. Yes. And Mather read the Catholics in an early discussion of an attempted exorcism of a woman named Mercy Short, who had been taken captive on the French Wabanaki border. He sees as a sign of her demonic possession. The fact that a French devotional tract, a Catholic devotional tract in his library, flew off the shelves and mysteriously opened to a certain page. Well, you read that description of his interaction with Mercy Short and think, Cotton Mather, what were you doing with these Catholic devotional tracts in French? But that's part of his quality as a polymath who was just interested in everything. And this Acosta text that he had 
which turns out in my research to have been procured by Samuel Sewell at considerable expense. He had it specially imported from Amsterdam, and he also had a Spanish Protestant Bible imported from Amsterdam. The takeaway here is Mather was absolutely interested in reading everything that the Catholics had to say, even though he thought it was mistaken. And the same is true with his longstanding interest in Hebrew and in Judaism. And one of the people who might have been involved in his actual learning of Spanish was a local pair of brothers, Samuel and Joseph Frazon, who spoke Ladino, which is a Spanish dialect from the days before the expulsion of the Jews from peninsular Spain. I know we're really curious about the process for how Cotton Mather learned Spanish and how he went about writing his Spanish tract. But I think one more contextual question that we need to ask is, Cotton Mather read a lot of Catholic tracts and he learned about the ways Catholics were missionizing among indigenous peoples. And he mentioned that he disagreed with the Catholics and their different methods. Kirsten, would you talk about the problems that Mather, this Protestant minister, saw in Catholicism and what he was hoping to address if he learned how to write in French or Spanish? So he, first of all, sees the Pope and the church in Rome as the Antichrist. And he shared with a lot of these Catholic thinkers and with earlier missionaries to indigenous people the idea that the promised millennial return of Christ might be on the horizon. And Samuel Sewell, in fact, wrote a whole tract about this where he postulated that the New Jerusalem might be in Mexico City. So the other epigraph on the verso of the title page, in addition to the reference to Jose de Acosta, which was an important clue for me, it refers to the book of Revelation and it identifies Rome as the seat of the Pope and the Antichrist. So it's a direct jab at Catholics and at the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. So there are also references in La Fe del Cristiano to the proscription against eating meat on certain days. He says that's not in the Bible. He says that purgatory is not a real thing. So in general, he takes issue with the Catholic liturgy, with beliefs around what the approved sacraments are. And how representative were Cotton Mather's Protestant issues with Catholicism? Actually, before we go down this interesting path, we should really take a moment for our episode sponsor. Our conversation has allowed us to explore the context of Cotton Mather's Spanish language text, La Fe del Cristiano. And what we found is that Mather took the time to learn Spanish and become fluent enough in it that he could write a 16-page discourse on the merits of Protestantism that Spanish-speaking Catholics could read, understand, and hopefully be persuaded by. Now today, some of us communicate with our friends, family, and coworkers via different languages. And nearly all of us communicate with these people via email, text, and other internet-based messaging services. But how do we know that what we're communicating is not being intercepted by unwanted third parties? The truth is, we can't know, unless we're using a secure VPN service like NordVPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. NordVPN is a service that protects your connection to the internet and your online privacy by hiding the IP addresses that your devices use to communicate with the internet. Now, NordVPN is an easy-to-use service that operates at a very fast speed. And you can use your NordVPN account on up to six devices, which means you can share your protection with your family. NordVPN also supports Macs, PCs, iPhones, and Androids, so it'll work no matter your favorite device. Now, if you're like me, you may be wondering, why do I need a service like NordVPN? One of the reasons that I like NordVPN is, as I said, it protects my information and monitors whether my online credentials have been exposed to the black web. I also enjoy NordVPN when I travel. Tim and I like to travel around the United States and abroad. Using NordVPN allows us to log into our streaming services so that we can enjoy watching our favorite sports teams, TV shows, and movies while we're waiting in airports or have some downtime. You can get your exclusive NordVPN deal, which includes a big discount plus four extra months free at nordvpn.com slash BFW. 
Your trial with NordVPN is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, to get your deal, visit nordvpn.com slash bfw. That's nordvpn.com slash bfw. Kirsten, how representative were Cotton Mather's issues with Catholicism in comparison with other Protestants, or at least those Protestants in New England? I mean, Mather was writing a lot of religious tracts, so he was influencing how early New English people thought. But did other New Englanders and religious men share his ideas about what was wrong with Catholicism and why Protestantism was, in their view, a more enlightened religion? Absolutely. He is strongly anti-Catholic, and most of the English colonies, with the exception of Maryland, were as well. Interestingly, one of the points of connection that he tries to cultivate with the Jewish family in town, with the Sephardic Jews, is that they were persecuted by the Catholics in Spain. And so he seems to set up this relationship with them where he uses them, I postulate, to help him master Spanish. Sewell mentions that He's indebted to the Frazons for a sight of the Spanish Bible, by which he meant the Hebrew Bible, not the entire Christian Bible with the New Testament, which he had to import, especially from Amsterdam. And that question about the Spanish Protestant Bible, the fact that something like that even existed is also interesting. So after he has these discussions about the Spanish-speaking world with the Frazons, and he learns about the Sephardic diaspora and how a lot of those people expelled from Spain came to the Caribbean islands in particular, and the Frazons went from there to Boston. He turns around and sends a copy of his completed tract of La Fe del Cristiano to Samuel Frazon and hopes that he will read it in one of the languages that he speaks and be converted. Could we talk more about the Frazons and how Mather went about learning Spanish? As we said, colonial New England was known for many things, but in the 17th century, it was not known as a place where a lot of fluent Spanish speakers lived. So if you're someone like Cotton Mather, this English colonist, how did you go about learning this other European language if there were just so few people to talk to or learn from. He had entered Harvard at the age of 11 based on the fact that he passed the Latin exam so fluently. He had learned to speak Latin at his father's knee, literally, and then gone on to grammar school as the elite did and from there to Harvard. But his proficiency in Latin was spoken as well as written because that was the norm of the day in Europe. And although the practice of speaking Latin was dying out in Oxford and Cambridge, his father tried to enforce the rule that students at Harvard should be speaking Latin all the time in order to make them fluent. It's like an immersion practice. So some people who looked at Lafido Cristiano thought that he could just fake his way through the Spanish language because of his advanced proficiency in Latin. And Spanish is different enough, although it's probably the closest of the Romance languages to what spoken vulgar Latin was in the centuries after the collapse of the Roman Empire. He still needed to know something about Romance philology, about how Latin became these other spoken dialects. And it's not really plausible to me that having invested so much in the four proficiencies with Latin in knowing how to write it, read it, speak it, and hear it and understand it auditorially. Those were the practices of the missionary linguists. They all believed in cultivating all four proficiencies. So it wasn't a writing and reading alone kind of language acquisition. That idea that you can learn a language just for reading is really something that happens a little bit later in the 18th century. Now, Spanish and French were not taught at Harvard. That doesn't happen for a long time. That divide between the classical and modern languages that we understand now, it didn't really exist in Mather's time. So 
my hypothesis is that he sought out people who knew Spanish as a spoken tongue, which could include people who were traders, people who had had experience in the Spanish Indies or the Spanish Americas, as he variously calls this space. And that's why I think that if the category Spanish Indian, which is really a vague category, we don't know exactly what the ethnicity or race of these people was, if the category of Spanish Indian meant to him something like a person who looks indigenous but speaks Spanish, those people could have been his collaborators in the project of learning Spanish. How likely do you think it was for those Spanish-speaking Indians, people he's keeping enslaved in his household, how likely do you think it was for those Spanish-speaking Indians to help Mather learn to write Spanish? It seems they could have helped him learn to speak Spanish, but where would Mather have picked up the ability to write in that language? Francisco de Pareja's missions, the mission system in Florida, were already collapsing by Mather's time. And one tragic consequence of this collapse was that refugees from those missions, which included some of the people who had been educated over the years in these mission schools and perhaps knew how to write Spanish or write Latin, some of those people were enslaved and traded as far as New England. We know that they were in New England as well because New England was undergoing a labor shortage at this point. And Indian slavery is one of those topics that recent historians have really tried to bring back into focus. I think that it's more likely that to undergird his written command of Spanish, Mather and Sewell looked for Spanish language textbooks. Okay, so it doesn't sound like Mather learned Spanish just like we would today using an app. I mean, apps didn't exist back then, but going to school and learning Spanish. It seems that he really did seek out the help of indigenous Spanish-speaking enslaved people, the Frazons, along with other traders and sailors who would have been coming in and out of town from the Caribbean and possibly through an imported Spanish textbook. Kirsten, as Mather gained proficiency with Spanish, I can imagine him sitting down with that Spanish Protestant Bible. And as Mather sat down and read this Spanish Bible, what do you think he found in it? Do you think he found the Spanish-speaking Bible to be an accurate representation of Protestantism and the Protestant faith? Or do you think it just added to his issues with Catholicism? I imagine it was a surprise to Mather and to Sewell to find out that a complete Spanish-language translation of the Bible even existed. And it had been completed in 1602 by a Spanish Protestant revising earlier people's work. And of course, the Catholic Church at this time prohibited the translation of the Bible into vernaculars. And this is one thing that the Protestants condemned the Catholic Church for doing, is for keeping the precious word of life, as Mather says in La Fe del Cristiano, from people who should be reading it. So what he does in the Spanish tracts, and actually La Fe del Cristiano is made up of two separate tracts. The other one is called La Religión Pura, the Pure Religion. They're bound together in this 16-page pamphlet. One of the things he does is take some specific verses from the Spanish Protestant Bible and changes the grammar when necessary to shorten them in order to squeeze as much as possible into his limited space. So. Mather was not just a well-educated person. He was very aware of the craft of printing. And because he had done so much work with the printers in Boston, he was one of their major patrons. He understood exactly how much manuscript writing he could fit into X number of pages. So this becomes an important clue to grasp exactly how proficient he became in Spanish, because he didn't translate directly from the Bible, and he certainly had polyglot versions of the original text plus the Latin translation. He didn't seem to do that work because when I examined carefully the Bible verses that he used, 
they followed this 1602 Spanish Protestant translation pretty closely, except, as I mentioned, when he had to shorten the Bible verse in order to make it fit into a smaller space. And let's talk more about Mather's Spanish tracts. If we were to look at La Fe de Cristiano and what Mather wrote, what will we find in this text? What was Mather writing about and what was he hoping to accomplish with this Spanish language tract? The content of the text is really caught up in its addressee. So imagining this audience of Spanish literate readers who were just waiting to hear this bit of wisdom. And he refers to the tract as a little fire that's going to catch a blaze in what he understood as the waiting people who were just waiting for this new revelation of Protestantism. And he thinks it's going to liberate them and save them because his whole cosmology, his worldview is that the elect the people who are predestined by God to be saved could be anywhere on earth. And you have to reach out to them and give them the opportunity to hear this salvific word, this word that's going to save their souls. And they might only speak Spanish, or they might speak Spanish in addition to other languages. And so his work in Spanish was augmenting the work of earlier missionary linguists who had done that for indigenous languages in North America. But I think he had a very capacious idea of America. And when he refers to himself as an American, he sees that as in the hemispheric sense, in the sense of the entire hemisphere of North and South America bound together. Even North America was not the North America we think of now. It was really dominated by, at least claimed by, New Spain. He has a vision, I think, that Spanish speakers might be brought around to see the light in his view, right? To kind of come out from their benighted worldview of Catholicism and join him as an American in this new world that is being shaped in his view. And in his lifetime, he sees many transformations, including the rise of Boston to become an important port city and also a place to which enslaved people from Africa are imported. And this is another story that I trace in the book about how, in addition to the Spanish Indians in his household, he had people he referred to as Negro. And one of them was named Spaniard. We had mentioned earlier that Cotton Mather really wanted to be a missionary, but he felt that he was too old by 1699 and that the age of missionary work had really passed him by. But it sounds like with his writing, Mather was performing missionary work and working to add to the ways that Europeans tried to missionize the unconverted. So it seems like Mather was adding an academic component to missionary work rather than just working on the ground and interacting with indigenous peoples, which is normally how we think about missionary work. Absolutely. He used text as his second voice. And although he was apparently a very charismatic preacher, he began life with a stutter. And some biographers have presented it as he was so loquacious in his production of text. He just wrote so, so much, including that million word Bible commentary, perhaps as a response to the difficulties that he encountered in speaking when he was younger. Now, what do we know about the publication and circulation of La Fe del Cristiano? Cambridge, Massachusetts was the home of the first printing press in North America, and Boston later acquired a couple of its own. So Mather lived in an area of Massachusetts where he could have had his text printed locally. But did he have it printed locally? Did he send his work to London or even Amsterdam instead? Because both of those places have extensive publication networks and circulation networks that could have allowed his text to possibly make its way to Spain in New Spain, where the people he wanted to read it would read it. Where did he have his text printed? 
Yes, his historical work, Magnalia Christi Americana, was published in London. He was hoping that his Bible commentary would be published in London too, because they had the capacity to produce those larger books. But the vast majority of the 300 plus tracts and pamphlets, these are all what he called small books. So they weren't bound, although they could be collected and bound by individual readers later, but they were basically like what you would come up with if you folded a couple of pieces of eight and a half by 11 paper together and stitched them in the middle. And all of the equipment for producing these texts in Boston had to be imported. The paper, the ink, the type, there was no type foundry in Massachusetts. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting about this text, which is not particularly beautiful, it's not particularly well produced. You can tell that it was a rustic Boston press that made it. But one of the things that is intriguing about the text as a physical object is that there are no diacriticals or accent marks on the vowels, but there is a repeated use of the enye, which is really important in the Spanish word señor or lord. And because the enye comes as a specially cast type, and it wasn't included in the typical English case of printer's type, one wonders, how did that enye get in there? And so I show in the book how a printer had to take a file and use a double F character and mess with it in order to make something that looked sort of like an enye. And it's not perfect. You can tell that it was a kind of handmade craft. I call it brascuache, which is a Chicano or Mexican-American word for something that's kind of thrown together in a folksy, homemade way. And do we know anything about how far from Boston Le Fay del Cristiano circulated? Did Mather's tract ever make it to New Spain or even Spain? It's such a great question, and everybody wants to know that. The three copies that survived, one of them almost certainly came through his family because it's held at the American Antiquarian Society, which received a number of Mather's personal papers. It's a very important source for me and for anyone researching the Mathers, as is the Massachusetts Historical Society. So one copy probably came through the family. We don't know about the Harvard and the New York Public Library copies, where exactly they came from. And the Inquisition was operative, of course, in every Spanish-controlled territory. And the Inquisition supposedly carefully monitored the importation of texts and checked to make sure that items were on the approved list. Now, one advantage of this small, kind of beat-up, rustic-looking pamphlet is that you could smuggle it. So Mather did take some of his other tracts, or what he called the small books, and handed them to sailors to spread in the places where they were going. He gave them to other people of his acquaintance to spread around. He was a kind of one-man distribution network. So he'd give 10 copies to one person to spread somewhere. And it's interesting to think about whether he might have given some copies of his Spanish tracts to his oldest son, who ended up being a Caribbean trader. But that's in the realm of speculation. We don't have any hard evidence that any reader in the Spanish Americas or in Spain itself actually read this text. There's a sign that some readers in Europe had seen it, but there is a Mexican historian who found a reference in the Philippines to a Protestant catechism that had been prevented from entering the Philippines. And the Philippines was governed by New Spain also because of the Acapulco connection. So that's a very intriguing possibility that someone at least found it and it got as far as the Philippines and then someone intercepted it. So we don't know if that rejected text from the Philippines was Mather's text for sure, but we can speculate that it could have been. It was just referred to as 
a kind of wicked Protestant catechism. And you could see La Fe del Cristiano as a kind of catechism because it sets out these articles of belief, but it doesn't specify the author. And another thing that's curious about this text, and I think kind of sweet, is that it's not actually Cotton Mather listed on the title page. The author is listed as C initial Mathero. So he adds this O to the end of his surname as if he's trying to cloak his identity, but it's not really cloaking his identity because you can see right through that. But I see it as something like the way that English-speaking kids today in Spanish classrooms give themselves a Spanish name. Now, as we zoom out from the details of La Fe del Cristiano, one of the central arguments that Kirsten makes in her book, Cotton Mather's Spanish Lessons, is that language was a tool of empire. Kirsten, would you tell us more about language as a tool of empire and how a work like Le Fe del Cristiano represents a tool of empire? I actually started this book thinking that it was going to be the preface to a longer book about the history of attitudes surrounding the Spanish language in the U.S. And how did it go from being considered a language of culture, from being considered a language in which republics could communicate with one another in the early decades of the 19th century, to being a language that was associated with a working class population and with a racialized population of what we would now call Latinos. And then the mystery of how this text got printed and published kind of got away from me and possessed me. So I wrote this whole book about it. But more than being a tool of empire, language policy is a reflection of who is in power and who is out of power at any given time. And there are shifts and waves in people's individual attitudes towards specific languages versus the kind of broader, what I call language ideologies that obtain in a culture at large. And right now, we are in a situation where the rights of people to use the language that they're most comfortable with are always being challenged. They're always being called into question. Language rights is a term that I coin in response to Jose de Acosta and his missionary logic, which was that you need to meet people where they are rather than forcing them to learn the language of power. That's interesting. And even today, I think many of us can still come up with examples of how language is used as a tool of empire and as a symbol of power. Yes, absolutely. And the complicated thing about these texts in missionary linguistics, which include not only the Indian library in Algonquian and the Library of Tamuqua texts produced by Pareja and his indigenous collaborators in Florida. It also includes the many texts in indigenous Mesoamerican languages that were printed in Mexico City, as was the set of texts in the Florida language of the Tamuqua. Those texts seem to many people to be evidence of what was really a pretty violent process of evangelization and often forced conversion of indigenous people. At the same time, they also have this other power today, which is that they can help revitalize those tongues because they have frozen in time a kind of record of the sounds of that language. Kirsten, you talked about the many different languages that Mather was fluent in. He was fluent in Latin. He was reading Spanish and writing in Spanish and French. Plus, all of the classical biblical languages. How many languages did you need to know to research this project? (laughs) Well, I relied heavily on the amazing work of Alejandra Dubkovsky and George Aaron Broadwell in resurrecting the Tamuqua language and more about the mission projects in Florida. I find that a really fascinating and undercredited story in early U.S. history. So I'm fluent in Spanish. I have some Latin, but relied on some help with the Latin and French. I read the French as well and offered my own French translations. I have a very irreverent 
English translation at the back of the book where I give a transcribed version of La Fe del Cristiano and my own translation. And I say irreverent because I preserved some of the errors. I wanted to make a translation that would reproduce what it might have sounded like to a native Spanish speaker at the time to read Mather's imperfect Spanish because he achieved a kind of high intermediate proficiency, but it was not perfect. And some of the errors were probably typos, but other errors were just typical learner language errors, like getting a preposition wrong. So I preserved that and I preserved some of the ambiguity or uncertainty that came about because of the lack of diacritical marks, the accent marks on verbs. Now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Kirsten, in your opinion, what might have happened if Cotton Mather had started a conversation with Spanish intellectuals like da Costa with his publication of La Fe del Cristiano? What do you think we would learn about the history of early America if this conversation had existed? So one of the really intriguing counterfactuals for me is what if La Fe del Cristiano had reached Mexico City and it's a little bit too late for it to have reached the desk of Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, who was one of the great intellectuals of Baroque Mexico City, which was the center of intellectual life on the North American continent. She had died a few years prior to that. But there's a kind of parallel intellectual to Mather in Mexico City, Carlos Siguenza de Góngora, who was in fact really interested in Florida and the course of the Mississippi and what was happening in New Mexico and other places that are now part of the United States. And it would have been amazing for Mather and Siguenza de Góngora to get into a conversation, a correspondence in Latin about their shared vision of the Americas and what role the Americas would play in the larger course of world history. It's also interesting to think about what would have happened if the same set of Enyes and the specially adapted printing equipment had been used to produce more tracts after La Fe del Cristiano, because this is the first Spanish language text produced in what is now the United States. And there would not be another one for almost 100 years until some language texts and other political tracts began to be produced in Philadelphia. And there, too, they had to import and kind of adapt existing printing equipment to represent the Spanish language. But this was part of Sewell's plan to branch out from La Fe del Cristiano and maybe print a whole new Spanish Bible, and in his words, to bomb the Spanish Americas with these Bibles. And the idea was that once people read them, they couldn't help but come around to the Protestant way of seeing things. So now that you've fulfilled your desire to know more about Cotton Mather and La Fe del Cristiano, (laughs) where are your interests taking you now? What are you researching and writing about now? Yeah, so I'm actually following the same track of recuperating the history of Spanish language print culture in what is now the United States. And I'm working on a piece about the early New York publisher La Nusa Mendia y Compañía in the late 1820s, who produced about 30 really quite beautiful Spanish books. And this is a story that's not told in traditional histories of printing in the early republic. And I'm interested in particular in whether the equipment, including things like the Enyes, was sold to some of the other early publishers in Spanish. Because I'm located in California, I'm also interested in California connections. 
And I wonder if this had anything to do with the first printing press in California that was run by Agustin Zamorano in the early 1830s. That's a fascinating project. I'm looking forward to reading that. Now, if we have more questions about Spanish language printing in the early United States or even before it became the United States, where's the best place for us to send our questions? My website is kirstensilvagrews.sites.ucsc.edu. Kirsten Silva Grews, thank you for helping us better understand Cotton Mather and the context for his attempts to learn and communicate in the Spanish language and what he thought that might do for missionary work. Thanks so much, Liz. It's been a great pleasure. La Fe del Cristiano is a curious text. As Kirsten related, it's a 16-page discussion about the principles of Protestantism written in Spanish with the hope that it would find its way to Catholic readers who would be persuaded by its arguments and, quote, liberated from the chains of Catholicism. At least, that's what author Cotton Mather, a famed Puritan minister from Boston, hoped his text would do. Unfortunately, as Kirsten revealed, we don't know if Mather's text persuaded any Spanish Catholics to convert to Protestantism. But that doesn't mean that Mather's text is unhelpful. Mather's text allows us, in the present, to see and ask new questions about the past. For example, how was it that a colonial Englishman in Boston was able to acquire the Spanish language skills he needed to write a religious tract? Or why did Cotton Mather feel a text expounding on the principles of Protestantism was important? Or why did he think that writing his text in Spanish was crucial to persuading people to convert to Protestantism? And who did Cotton Mather mean when he addressed his text to Los Españoles? These are questions we likely would not have asked if Cotton Mather had never written Le Fe del Cristiano, which is a short text with just three remaining copies in all of the world. Now, Kirsten's point about viewing language as a tool of empire is also interesting to think about. In history, we often think about meeting our audiences where they are at in terms of their knowledge and interest in history. It's a question that the Innovation Studios team and I ask ourselves when we produce every episode of this podcast. What are the episode topics that you will find interesting? What do you already know about these topics? And how can we use any given episode topic to expand your knowledge about early America, its people, and events? We ask these questions so that we can meet you where you're at with your interest and knowledge about early America. This listener-centered approach allows us to prepare episodes that we think you'll find engaging and interesting. Now, it's fascinating to think about how Cotton Mather was having similar thoughts in the early 18th century. He was also thinking, who is his audience for Le Fe del Cristiano? What do they know about Protestantism? And how can he most effectively reach and persuade this audience to leave their Catholic faith and join the Protestant faith? Unfortunately, we don't know his exact answers to those questions, but we can see through his text that he thought writing in Spanish, a language that many people throughout the Americas spoke and read thanks to Spanish colonization efforts, would be the most successful way to get people to pay attention to his words and understand the case he was making to convert to Protestantism. You'll find more information about Kirsten, her book, Cotton Mather Spanish Lessons, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today, all on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash three, seven, six. Don't forget to tell us what you think about Ben Franklin's world. Please help the Innovation Studios team and myself better serve you with this podcast by taking our listener survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Katie Schinebeck, Ashley Bachnight, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other early American language lessons, you know, to borrow from Kirsten's book title, would you like to know about? Is there some aspect of an indigenous language, African language, or one of the multitude of European languages that you would like to know more about when it comes to the history of early America? Tell me. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.